happy to have Lynn Van Artstall in. Welcome her to the Beautiful Artist Talk. Today we'll learn a little bit about her process and how she balances working from home with her art practice. And she'll show us some work, talk about her evolution as an artist from when she started out and to where she is today. Uh, Liz is going to mute everyone's audio so that we don't interrupt Lynn's talk. Please hold your questions and comments till after the talk, since we have a lot of people today. So we'll wait and do it in an organized way. And like Liz said, too, we will be recording. So take it away, Lynn. Okay. Um, well, hi. Um, my name is technically Linda, but I go by Lynn. I grew up as Lynn. Um, and I uh, want to thank the Flower City Arts Center for giving me the opportunity to do this talk. Um, a little bit about me. I am um, originally from Philadelphia. I moved to Rochester in 2015. In the daytime, my job is a software analyst. I've been in that company, Evolution, for 23 years. Um, I belong to a lot of different groups um, and uh, have more active in some than others because of where I'm living right now. Um, but I do enjoy participating and seeing a lot of the uh, textile art um, specifically. Um, in the past, I've been a member and participated in quite a few different nonprofit boards. Um, but when I moved to New York, I decided to focus on my artwork. So curiosity is what drives me to learn outside of my comfort zone. And I'm pretty much a self-taught person. I started when I was little. Uh, I was given a, an embroidery kit. Um, and so I grew up learning embroidery and sewing. And I also spent a lot of time outside and, and developed a love of nature. As a teenager, I got a camera and I found photography. And, and then later in my life, um, I guess when I was about mm, almost 30, um, I became curious about pottery. And I decided at that point, I don't want to be in my 60s and say, Oh, uh, I always wanted to learn how to do that, but I never did. So I just thought, I'm just going to start to learn. So I took some classes in pottery. And um, at one point, I had an accident and injured my hand. So I had to not, I couldn't do that anymore. Um, but pottery led me to weaving, and weaving led me to spinning, and also led me to felt making. And I did felt making for a very long time. And I used photography to take photographs of things that I would then transform into, into felt. Um, and felt making then brought me back to stitch work and photography, which led me to cyanotype, which led me to printmaking. But I really do enjoy doing cyanotype. Um, I am a from frenetic artist, so I rotate between all of these things periodically. I have projects in my house for all of them undone and some sit for years and then I pick them up again. So each one of these things has taught me skills and it changes my way of thinking and I just keep wanting to learn more. And when I learn more, I try to figure out or it just pops my head, how can I apply that to something I've already done? So I dug into my, um, my memory banks for some, for some photographs and things of uh, work that I've done in the past. So here's a photograph of a stoneware silo that I did back in 1992. I lived in an area that was very historic and um, I really like looking at the, the historic buildings and such. And I saw a silo one day in the woods and decided to create that out of pottery. And then I started, did a little bit of functional and I thought I could use, you know, this and make something for the house. So, and you can see where I start to like bring weaving into the, into this kitchen basket. Hey Lynn, technical problem. We can't see your photos. Oh, wait, oops. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> can't see my photos. Oh, okay. There we go, thank you. I'm um, sorry. Okay, so I'll just go through these. Okay, so here is the, the silo that I was just talking about a moment ago. Actually, I, oops, I used this right today for uh, dog cookies for Lola. 
um, it, it's a really nice heavy duty container. And this is the um, kitchen basket that I made. And you can see in this photograph that, that there's weaving involved. Um, I don't really have a lot of weaving. I did a lot of shoelaces for my daughter's girlfriends when they were little. And um, I'm not sure where all my weaving pieces went to, but I don't have a ton of them. But I do have some, some photographs of some felt work. This is a, a scarf that I did. Um, it's, it's a silk uh, background with uh, merino wool that's um, felted onto it. And it's a very lightweight and warm scarf. And I really enjoyed felt making. Um, but, uh, and I, I'm pretty sure I'll, I'll go back to that at some point in time. But right now I'm moving in another direction. Here is a piece I did actually. And when I say I circle back to things, this is what I'm talking about. Um, I created this piece, it's a felted piece and this is more of a detail shot. It's not very big. Um, I created it back in 2000. I took a uh, felt making class with Pat Spark in New Jersey. And it came out really dark and I, I really liked the piece, but it was so dark that you could barely see it. And then last year I pulled it out and I thought, you know what, I bet if I did some stitching on this, I could lighten this up. And it really did. I was able to make a big difference in this piece um, just by doing some stitching on it and making it brighter in some areas. This is another piece and I did this for the Northeast Felt Makers Guild. They had an exhibition called Creation Myth. And I did some research on different creation myths. And I, I had a lot of friends who were Korean. I knew a lot of Korean people from where I lived. And I thought that this was a fascinating um, story about a bear and a tiger and they both wanted to become human. And so uh, a God came down and said, live in a cave and eat garlic and mugwort for 30 days and I'll make you human. <laughs> I don't know, I think I'm remembering this correctly. So um, the tiger after a couple of days decided that he was a tiger and that was it. He wasn't gonna do the silly stuff, but the bear kept at it and um, eventually became human. And so I embroidered on the top of these, these are felted pieces, what I call watercolor felts. Um, so they're felted pieces that uh, on the bear, I have embroidered in Korean something, I don't remember exactly what it says, but I think it's something like um, the bear prevailed and became human. And um, my ex-husband used to do wrought iron and he created the wrought iron frames for these. And then the, the raffia is woven and the pieces are mounted onto the front of that. And the beads that I picked over, over here were to symbolize garlic and mugwort. And the stars are, are symbolic for the, um, the God who came down from the heavens. And also uh, a lot of this was um, waxed linen to hold it together. And I really, it, I really like these pieces. Um, and then later I decided I was going to learn how to go scuba diving. So back to photography and I used to dive with a GoPro and this is uh, what people called the stairway to heaven in Dutch Springs, Pennsylvania, which is around Bethlehem. Um, and this is taken underwater and you can actually see the sky in this picture. If you look up, I just thought this is a really cool digital print. Um, and yes, I took an underwater selfie. I thought the bubbles going up were kind of fun. Um, so then in 2017, I decided to take a cyanotype class at the Flower City Art Center with John Merritt. And he's got a talk later, um, later this month, I think. Um, and I learned how to do cyanotype with digital negatives. And I really enjoyed this, but the entire time I was, I was doing this, I'm going, I wonder what this would look like on fabric. This would be perfect for fabric. I really want to do this on fabric. So John told me, yeah, you know, you should, you should play around with this. And so I started playing around with it on fabric um, on my own. I found some denim squares and uh, I started putting lace on top of denim squares and cyanotyping them. 
And I discovered that some squares that I had were not cotton and they didn't work. It washed out completely. But some squares actually were cotton. So that's where I started playing around with the different types of fabric. Um, and then, yeah, I thought, oh, this lace, I wonder what else I could do with it. So I was doing some research and I found out about anthotypes and I had a little red wine left over. So I stuck it on some paper and, and uh, exposed this to the sun for a couple of months and it came out okay. Um, the only problem with anthotypes is that uh, the more exposure to the light, the more they fade. So I didn't really like that idea, but I did not have that problem with cyanotypes. So I started doing cyanotypes on silk scarves and um, my daughter had given me some silk blanks she had left over from college. And so I was playing around with them and they came out just amazing. And when you do a cyanotype on silk, the depth that you get is just incredible. And it's a lot different than when you do it on, on linen or cotton. Silk just seems to have this amazing depth to it. And, uh, and I learned that by spraying with vinegar and adding like turmeric and just the heat of the sun in the backyard, because I'll do these in the yard because they're so long, um, changes the colors that you get because the heat and the plant mixture with the vinegar and the cyanotype, um, it, it creates these beautiful yellows and greens and other colors that you can get too. Um, and I do have to say at this point that Mark Watts took most of the really good pictures and the ones that aren't so good are the ones that I took um, to use in this. He, um, he does a lot of the artwork uh, photography for me and makes my stuff look amazing. So I went from silk scarves and I was, I, I believe that invasive species are something that, um, that we really have to think about and so I walk on the beach every week and pick up pieces of driftwood and I wanted to use that in, in a piece somehow. So we, we were walking on the beach and I said, oh, I'm gonna look for a, a piece of driftwood that looks like a fishtail. And that's where this carp came from was the driftwood I found looked like a fishtail and I built the fish around it with scraps of fabric that I had and stuffed it with wool. And then I decided that I was gonna do a couple of them. Um, I had a friend at work who uh, believed that she got bit by a, um, a lamprey in Keoka Lake. And so I thought that would be kind of interesting. So you can see in here, the uh, green is actually felt. It's, um, it's wool uh, locks that I used, um, wrapped around wire, I believe. And the, the lamprey eel actually has wire inside of it. And as I was, uh, when I was skin dive, scuba diving, um, I went up to Lake Huron one time and saw just hundreds and hundreds of goby in the bottom of the lake. So I decided that I would make a goby as well. And they have these really big eyes and I had a bunch of old lace that I used. And in the winter, I love walking along Lake Ontario. And I grew up in Philadelphia, so we didn't have a big lake that did strange things with the ice. And I took a, um, a photography class, at Flower City Art Center, and learned how to print black and white. And this is my, one of my favorite um, photographs that I took. Um, it's a sil silver gelatin print of Lake Ontario and the ice balls that form. Unfortunately, this last winter, it didn't get cold enough. Um, so then back to cyanotypes, because this is my part of my um, craziness. Um, I just jump from one thing to another. And this is, uh, I don't know if you've heard of the sketchbook project in New York City. I think it's in Brooklyn. I'm not, I'm not sure exactly anymore. Um, but I did this using cyanotype. I took the book apart that they gave me and reconstructed it. and um, did some cyanotypes on it and sent it back to them. So this is in the, in the museum with the sketchbook project. It's a fun kind of a thing to do. Um, and they give you a sheet with different things to, to think about as far as your, as your theme. So then um, 
you know, in continuing my craziness, I decided to take a calligraph class with Barb McPhail, and uh, I brought textiles into this. So in this, this is actually a print, but you can see if you look at this in the center of this, the circle, that's a piece of lace that I cut out. There's some rickrack here. If you're not familiar with that, it's a, a, a decorative type of, um, of material that's used in textiles. There's some other lace over here. Um, and I was just fascinated with the detail that came out of this from using that. So that got me very interested in printmaking. Um, so then I took a photogravure class with, with uh, Pat Bacon. Um, and then I, I went to uh, Zia Mays in Massachusetts and took more of a week long intensive to learn more about it. And I really enjoyed that. And this is a, a top of a cactus where I did in two colors and I, I reversed, I think this was a two plate one because the one plate had a slash in it. You can see it on the bottom right hand corner. Um, so I, I, I uh, inked both plates in different colors and, and, and flipped them. So one was in the opposite direction of the other. And I really like this print. And, and as I was doing all these prints that week, I, I thought, man, this is something I also enjoy. I wonder what this would look like on fabric, but I haven't gotten around to doing that yet. Um, and here's another uh, photo reviewer that I did from the digital negative. And uh, I altered the digital negative to have a lot of scrapes on it. And then in addition to that, I also altered the plate after I used the negative to create the plate. Um, in, in this case, the floor had bricks on it. So I laid the plate on the floor, stepped on it and twisted it under my foot to scrape it up. Um, and it, it gave some interesting um, marks on this. So then um, I decided to continue with printmaking. I went out to Yosemite with my daughter last year and I took a bunch of photographs. And this was a, based on a photograph that I took um, of Tanaya Lake and I turned it into a lino cut. And I thought, well, I'm supposed to take a woodcut class later, um, but I want to learn lino cut. I'll practice on this. And this came out really well. Um, and I discovered that um, there's a program that I could get from my iPhone that uh, allowed me to um, convert the photograph into something that would look like a lino cut from a photograph that I took. And, and that's what I did here. So then I thought, well, gelatin printing sounds kind of cool too. Let me try that. <laughs> um, so this was actually, this is actually two pieces. Um, the bottom piece, you can see over here, it says William of Orange is a book that I got at the library for 50 cents that was written by William Churchill on history. And I deconstructed the book and I took this page and I just gelatin printed it in different colors. And then later on, I decided I had I gathered a couple leaves from the lake and um, I decided to, to try those. So I did those on silk organza and I just happened to sit them on top of each other with the silk organza on top of this. And I thought, wow, that looks really cool. So I, um, I put them together and this is something I want to pursue more is doing more printing on top of silk organza with um, with some kind of a different paper background in different colors because the silk organza piece is really, uh, it, it's very light, but when you put it on top of something else, you can get amazing, de the amazing detail that it gets printed on it shows up. So then I'm of course back to cyanotype because I just go in these loops um, and decided that I was not happy with just doing cyanotypes at home. I wanted to, to take them with me. And, and figured out a way to do that. So I bought some Coroplast from Home Depot and some uh, clear acrylic and I got some bowl clips and I had some pieces of uh, pre-treated cyanotype fabric and I cut them into four inch squares and I would put those in a, in a black bag with me and take the frames with the clips. And then as I was going somewhere, I would collect stuff and I had a piece of uh, clear Doralar that I would write on with a Sharpie on, you know, where I collected the things because I discovered there are all these ferns and 
I was staying in a place that had this old grill and it was the perfect place to lay the cyanotypes in the sun. But I've also done it inside of my, my car um, in the front window. I'll be driving around with cyanotype cooking in my car. And I also have taught, um, I taught a class at Main Street Arts and, um, and then last year I taught at the Rochester Weavers Guild because they have the, a great setup in their back room for, for teaching this. It's, it's got a lot of space and there's water and, and electric and I had a plenty of room to set up the UV lights. These are three of my students. I asked them to pick out the pieces that they were they're most happy with. Their favorite pieces that they did that day. And, um, and this is what they did. I was supposed to teach there again this year, but it was canceled because of the virus. So I make these scarves and I ended up with a bunch of them I didn't like as scarves. And they had like, they were like almost all perfect, but not quite. So I thought, what can I do with these? So I decided to weave them together. Um, and I, I went and looked on online and all these different patterns because you know, there's a lot of different type of weaving patterns. And I picked out the twill pattern because I thought it would be an interesting pattern. And if you're a weaver, you probably would look at this and go, oh yeah, that's a twill pattern. Um, so I did that with the scarves with one piece going over the, the front of, in front of a piece of a scarf that I didn't like the back piece. And it came out really well. This is actually quite a big piece. I think it's like uh, 60 inches long by 54 wide. So it's hanging on a wall in my bedroom right now. Um, but I really like it and it's got a real fluidity to it. Um, when it's hanging, it moves and it has, uh, and I like that movement. Um, this is a piece that I did uh, earlier this year. I think I actually did the cyanotype last year. Um, and I used pieces of the lemon that had been dried in my dehydrator and laid them on and did the cyanotype. And then one day I was in the kitchen and I saw this, um, I think it was a clementine box with the orange thing on the top. And I thought, huh, I wonder what I could do with that. And I like put it down and I had the cyanotype sitting there and I was like, hmm, maybe I'll iron it on this and see what happens. So I did and it came out really cool. I really like it. Uh, I put parchment paper on top so I didn't ruin my, my iron. Um, and it did adhere really well. So it's like a plastic and it, and it reminded me of, um, at the time, what was important was the children that were being contained behind cages in the migration in, in the South border of the US. And that's originally what I was thinking of when I put this together. Um, right now it's hanging in the Flower City Art Center in the member show, which was hung and then never shown because of the virus. Um, I also sent it into the hand magazine. So it's an issue 28, the May 2020 issue. So I wanna talk a little bit about how I do my cyanotypes because when I was taught, it was, you have to be really careful with the light. Um, you know, they're UV sensitive and I wanted to do bigger things. And I don't have anywhere inside that I could do that. So I thought, you know what, I'm just gonna play around with this and see what happens. So I got a couple of these plastic tabletops and I went out and taped some fabric to it. And I put my cyanotype chemicals in a spray bottle because I found that if I spray it on, I waste less chemicals than if I brush it onto fabric because fabric really absorbs it fast and, and if you're familiar with dyeing when you put any kind of liquid on a fabric it starts to bleed you know and, and expand so when I'm spraying it on I have better control of how much chemical I'm actually applying and, and I'm able to make sure it's all covered fairly well I do put these tables in a shady spot and I try to do them first thing in the morning before the sun comes out and then what I will do is I'll go around my yard and I'll cut pieces of plants. I have big ferns growing out front and I have a Japanese maple and I have all kinds of interesting plants growing in my yard. So I just go around my scissors and chop off whatever I see that appeals to me that day. 
and I'll lay it down and I have big pieces of plexiglass that I lay on top of the um, of everything and what this does is it creates a sharper image so you put the plant down and if you didn't have something holding it down and it's in the yard it would probably blow away but if it wasn't windy you would get a ghosty kind of image and not a sharp image and I prefer getting a sharper image so I decided after, um, after a while that I thought it would be interesting to do a quilt because I was teaching and I wanted to have something to show people the different colors that you can get when you tone the cyanotype. And you can tone fabric as well as paper. Um, and John did show a little bit of this in his class, but I explored it more. So I, I bought a kit of uh, these strips or two and a half inch long strips they're used by quilters of, it's made of Kona cotton and they're done in jelly roll quilts. So I bought white ones that were prepared for dyeing. So I didn't have to do anything special to the actual fabric. And I brought them into the backyard and I sprayed them and I laid stuff down on them. And I laid the plastic on top and I, there's a ton of these brick things laying around my backyard. You can tell some of them are probably a little blue there. And I lay them on top just to hold um, things down because I do get a lot of wind in my yard and they'll blow away. So I have two tables set up here where I, these are all filled with strips with plastic on top and brick down. And I normally leave it out there for four hours. Um, I know in, in the dark room we were doing maybe 30 seconds or two minutes or whatever, but I just leave them out for a couple hours until they turn the right color because it that it just feels right to me and it, and it seems to work really well. So I decided I needed to come up with a plan for these. So I don't know if you're probably most people are not familiar with quilt making. I'm not real good with other people's patterns, but I can create my own pattern. So I just got out the graph paper and decided that this was what I was going to do. Um, and I created this design. Um, to help me put the strips together because once you have them all cyanotyped and they're finished, you want to sew them together and then sew each block together. So you can see here I've got nine blocks that um, will be sewn together and each one has three long strips and then they each have six strips and the A, B, C, D indicates that they're going to be different. So here's a picture on the left um, that I showed before of the bricks holding down the plexi. And you can see on this where the bricks show up. And I'm not really concerned about that because these are going to be strips that are going to be cut up in different sections. And I can determine if I'm going to have that, that brick spot on it. But this is what it looks like when it's um, done before it's washed. So then I take the strips and I wash out the cyanotype chemical until it runs clear. And then I took some of the strips based on my pattern before of how many I thought I would need. And I added some, uh, I put them in a container with water and I added citric acid. And the ones here on the front left are a very bright blue that was from the citric acid make cha making changes to the chemistry of the cyanotype chemicals on the fabric and turning it into a brighter blue. The ones on the right and in the back here were all um, bleached in borax or washing soda. And I did that to, to make the whites whiter and strip out some of the color. And these were done for a short period of time in washing soda, but I did some others much longer and the longer that you soak them in the washing soda or the borax, the more color comes out. And so some of them came out very light blue or yellowish. And then these were just hanging on my deck to dry. And there's parts of my deck that are actually blue cyanotyped. Um, and I think it looks kind of cool. I actually thought about cyanotyping the whole deck, but that would take a lot of chemicals. So anyway, anyway um, on the top here is, this is a bad picture, um, but on the top, this is the regular cyanotype. And you'll see this, 
better colors in the quilt. So this is the regular cyanotype, the long strips on the top on this one. On the left side was a little bit toned in the borax just to strip, make the white whiter. Because if you look at the top, you'll see that the blue leaves, the leaves are a little, have a bluish tone to them. And when you put them in the borax, it makes the, blue, the light blue whiter. And then the middle two strips that are yellow were ones that were soaked in borax for much longer, maybe like 10 or 15 minutes. And when you're toning them, you have to be very careful um, and keep watching it. And as soon as it achieves the color you want, you need to take it out and rinse it immediately or it will keep turning. And the ones on the right, although they're not showing the bright blue or dyed, it, it were toned with citric acid. So this was the final quilt and I just finished this not too long ago. And you can see um, these brownish ones here, which I haven't discussed yet, were actually regularly cyanotyped strips that then I toned in the bore, I bleached them out with borax just a little bit for like maybe five minutes. And then I soaked those strips, I rinsed out the borax and then I so soaked them in a mixture of water and tannic acid to get the browns because I thought it would be a nice contrast. And because I wanted this intentional of this quilt was to show people in classes or when I do um, speaker engagements, the different colors that you can achieve with cyanotype. So it's not all just blue. You can get a lot of different colors and how they all kind of go together. And this is designed and put together in the pattern that I developed. On the backing of this, um, I like batiks. So I found a batik fabric that I had that was big enough. And I think this is about like a 40 by 40 inch square. So it's not giant, but it would be a wall hanging. And um, in the back, I still need to put the sleeve to hang it. But um, I took a piece of um, pre-treated cyanotype fabric and I buy some of that sometimes when I'm teaching because it's easier than having people um, use, you know, wet fabric in a class that you don't have sunlight in. And so what I do is I take a piece of clear Dorilar and I wrote on that the details of the quilt. So this is called Shades of Blue and it details, you know, that I use botanical materials and cotton fabric and how I toned the different colors and when I finished it. And I sewed this onto the back of the quilt. Um, I learned that from my mother who has made some amazing quilts. I don't normally make quilts. I'm not a quilt maker, so my corners aren't perfect and, and my edges don't match up, um, but it still looks pretty cool. Um, and so if you want to look at more of my work, and I know it's not up to date, but um, ladyfishfelt.com is my website. I have a lot of photographs out there. Um, my email is um, on the card on the left, ladyfishfelt at gmail.com. If you're interested in having somebody do your photographing your artwork, then you want to contact Mark because he does some amazing work. He took photographs of the quilt and a lot of the other artwork for me too. All the pictures that look really good, he took. And so I'd like to open it up for questions. If um, somebody, if you wanna bring people off of uh, mute. Yeah. Thank you, Lynn. I'm literally blown away. I just I'm practically speechless. I didn't, I didn't know the depth and breadth of your work. And it's exciting to see how willing you are to experiment with all types of materials and processes. And I just wanted to ask, in your bio, you call yourself a fiber artist. But do you think that as you have evolved as an artist, that, that that's changed for you? And maybe you're a multimedia artist now, or are you still very much purely a fiber artist first. No, I probably am more of a multimedia artist, but I just never really thought about it. So mm -hmm. you're probably right. I probably should change that, but <laughs> I don't know. I like the feel of the fabric. So 
um, I don't know. I, I think that you're probably right. I probably am a multimedia artist, but I always do seem to go back to, to fabric or, or fiber and, and for it, try to bring it, incorporate it into my work somehow. <clears throat> and, and I like experimenting. Um, I think that you know, a lot, I've, there's a lot of things I've experimented with that were failures. And I think it's really important to fail um, because it, you're not going to learn if you don't fail. And when you fail, you learn something, right? Every time you, something doesn't turn out right, you learn from that. And I think it's important to bring that, you know, into your life to, to just progress. Yeah. You talked about learning um, some of these techniques from your mother. And I know like embroidery and quilting and these sorts of, I don't want to say crafts, but arts are passed down through generations of women. What do you think about our modern day? Do you think that, that these things are at risk of being lost to history or do you feel strongly that people are still learning and passing these down? Well, I did pass uh, some of this down to my daughter. Um, I used to have her help me card wool um, when I was doing a lot of felt making. And she ended up going to, um, to Rhode Island School of Design and, and into textile arts. And she told me a story about how she was sitting there carding wool one day and um, the teacher came up and asked her if she grew up on a farm. And she was like, no, why? And she goes, well, you've just done 10 of these things and everybody else is struggling with one and you grab the wrong cards for it. So, so I don't know. I mean, I think that, um, you know, we teach our children what we do and they pick it up or they don't. But um, I guess it depends on, on what people are interested in. I think in textile arts, you need to you need to be willing to look at what other people are doing and learn from that as well. So I used to teach um, in an after school program in my daughter's elementary, we used to do shibori scarf making where we would, I designed a way for, um, for kids um, to work together. They would twist the scarf up, wrap it around a water bottle, drip on non-toxic dye and they would end up with these amazingly cool looking silk scarves. Mm -hmm. And I don't know like what impact that had on any of their lives, but later several of them would come up to me and go, I still wear that scarf I made. So I know that, you know, it did have an impact on their life. And, and I learned so much from doing that because they would do something I wouldn't even think of doing. Yeah. So I think it's, it's a give and take, you know? Mm -hmm. Lynn, how big is that piece, the Shades of Blue quilt? How big is that? Um, it's about 40 inches by 40 inches, I think. Mm -hmm. So maybe like a little over a yard, you know, square. Uh-huh. It's very, very dynamic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I had a lot of debate about, you know, how I was going to do the quilting because I'm not, I, you know, I put a lot of top of quilt tops together, but I've only ever done sewing on the lines, right, and not like done actual quilting. So I talked it over with a few people that I know, and um, and I got a bunch of different ideas, and I just thought, you know, I want to break up the squareness of it, but I don't want to really break it up too much. So I decided to just go with the lines going across. Um, and, and I think it works. I think it, you know, the, some of them are wavy and some of them aren't. Um, I think it does break up the squareness of it. Um, and, and I also find that working on smaller pieces instead of giant, like, uh, you know, blanket size quilts is much easier. And I don't do a lot of quilts. I'll do one like every few years. I think the lines are perfect for it because they're, they come across as being very organic. They make those browner pieces actually look like pieces of wood. Oh yeah, I hadn't looked at it that way. It looks like flooring. Oh yeah, no, it looks like driftwood. Yeah. yeah. I, I, just, I just find that whole piece just, it's just a perfect work of art. 
Yeah. Well, yeah. I look at my work and I'm like, ah, <laughs> oh, that corner in the upper right. I, I don't know. <laughs> Uh, really the thank you <laughs> the beauty comes through and i think all those things that you worry about are are adding to that beauty it's absolutely stunning i would yeah. love to own it personally and put it on my own wall you know it's yeah gorgeous. thank you thank you i was actually started to, to design this quilt as a teaching tool Mm -hmm. you know so that I could take it to a, a class or you know speak an engagement and show people what you can do with it because I think cyanotype is so much more flexible you can do so much more with it than just doing a picture on a piece of paper yeah, totally. I, I wanted to ask a quick question oh sorry I, I interrupted someone go ahead um I was just gonna say you talked about having the crisp images of the cyanotype, but I also really like how they contrast with the ghostly images in this one, especially in like the center square that's um, dark blue, that you have like a really ghostly strip in the middle. And oh, it's yeah. nice that it kind of sets apart from the crisp, clear ones. Yeah, and, and putting the strips together, you know, I was trying to, I didn't want them all uh, lined up the way that they were in the photograph. So I was trying to alternate them, but that was actually the one in the center here is a piece of pine tree. So it had a branch attached to it. And that's why it's more ghostly because it wasn't able to get flat onto the fabric because of the branch raised it up a little bit. But it does, I thought it looked really cool. And I like the way that the pine needles come across when you do them in cyanotype, you know, when they're still attached to the branch. So Lynn, back um, when you showed the creation myth pieces, yeah, I like that. Um, yeah. Yeah. So you talked a bit about the symbolism of the different beads and stuff like that. So I was wondering, is the fish, the fish in your name, the fish that you use, is that some kind of symbol for you that you come back to as an artist? Yes. Well, not as an artist, but I grew up um, in the summertime. My family had a cottage in, at Lake Willapalpac, and I would go there in the summer with my my brothers and my mom and you know we had a big lake we didn't have a car we we would go out and play in the woods and we had um you know a um, rowboat we would go out on the lake and we would fish so i always enjoyed fishing i thought it was fun all the fish they look so different um and it was just something that i did and i i love fishing um so i used to actually i used to fish in bass tournaments in Pennsylvania for many years before my daughter was born. Um, and I've just, fishing has always been a part of my life. I have a lot of fishing rods and tackle. Um, and I wanna get, I would like to go back to fishing, but um, as I said, I injured my right hand and um, lost my knuckle. So it's very hard for me to fish for a long period of time. So I had to stop fishing tournaments. Um, and I do still occasionally go fishing. So fishing was always a part of my life and it kind of represents that outdoor side of me. The part that I like being around water and on water and in water and underwater and um, fish are a part of that. I like watching fish when I was scuba diving. Um, so I actually caught a fish called a ladyfish and um and then i was felting at the same time and somebody else actually had ladyfish at gmail.com so i threw the felt on the end and that's how i got my my name oh okay cool thank you so much. i was wondering about the scale of these pieces too um i think they're about um oh, maybe about 12 inches wide by maybe 18 tall maybe 20 inches tall. And I did them as a pair mm -hmm. because they, they go together. Mm -hmm. 
And I like the way the um, the tiger and the bear just kind of seem to come out of the background. Yeah. You know, they're very subtle. And that's also something that's on, you know, I have this long list of things I want to try to do, um, you know, with different types of art. And one of them is to uh, try to do something that shows the camouflage that animals use, you know, that nature provided to them. And I have a group of photographs that I've taken. Um, and I have one in particular where it looks like a swamp, but there's actually a deer in it. <clears throat> this is a fun piece to do and actually is needle felted. And I, so what I did was I felted the background and then I, I used a, a special needle to put the details on the front of the actual bear face and the tiger. And then after I did that, I wet felted it again to make sure that everything stuck really well and it got rid of the needle holes. So I don't know if you're familiar at all with felt making. Very little personally. I don't know if anyone else is, but I know it's it's a long process, isn't it? Um, not really. I mean, you could do felt fairly quickly. Um, it, the layout really can take some time. Um, the scarf that I did in this one, the layout took me a long time. I would work on it little by little, but once you actually start felting, it doesn't really take the felt making itself turning it into felt doesn't really take long. The long part is the layout and the design of the piece. Mm -hmm. Can you go back to that one with the, I think it's got lily pads and the stitching. Yeah. This one? I saw this on Instagram and you had talked about how you came back to it 20 years later or something. Yeah. <laughs> but I just, I think it's brilliant to start adding in that stitching and bring up some highlights like you were wishing you had you know, before, it's absolutely gorgeous. Yeah, it was really dark and with stitching, you can see that the lily pads really start to pop up. Mm -hmm. So I stitched around them to try to make them pop up. And, um, and then I just tried to duplicate the colors that I used in the, in the wool in the background in the stitching in the front. And I think I, I'm almost done this piece. I just have this little, a little bit less than what's showing here um, to stitch. And then I, I, I think I'll just probably maybe put that in a frame. Mm -hmm. And it, so when people say to me, I don't know if you guys have this a lot, you'll go, they'll go, how long did it take you to do oh, that? You know, this one took me 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it takes your whole life to make one piece of art. Every it piece can. of art is your, is your whole life. Yeah, it can. And I have a lot of other pieces, and, and I find that if I do something on a piece of art and I'm not really happy with it, I'll put it aside, and then I'll come back to it, sometimes a year later, sometimes a month later. And it gives me a different perspective on what I'm looking at. Because when you're, in, when you're doing a piece... Um, you get so involved with this, the tiny little details of that piece that you're not really seeing it clearly the way other people do. So I find it's actually productive to just let a piece sit for a little while and then come back to it and look at it again with fresh eyes. I, I don't have a question, but I'm amazed at this body of work, all the different techniques and stuff that you put together to create this beautiful art. I mean, it's wonderful that you shared that all with us and gave us some, you know, information on your background and stuff, but it, it's just extraordinary. It's like a big wow for me. Oh, thank, oh, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I appreciate that. Yeah, actually, this was kind of fun because I haven't really ever put all this stuff together in chronological yeah. order before. Yeah. And as I was doing it, I was going, wow, I've been doing this for a long time. Yes, <laughs> yes very beautiful. Yeah. Huh. I had a similar feeling, Miss Sharon. I, I had no idea. I mean, I just met Lynn within the past year or so um, and saw a few things. I had no idea. Amazed. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? That was wonderful. It was really great. I'm glad I 
participated. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you all for joining and taking your time this Sunday to spend this hour with me.